In modern scholarship on the early history of Islam, the first hundred years or so is often viewed as a big question mark. Uh, the life of the Prophet Muhammad and his followers and the years following uh, was only written down a hundred years later, at least sometimes two hundred years later, in biographies known as Sira and in the Hadith literature. And this literature was also written by Muslims themselves, making them subject to bias and such things. Because of this, much of the Hadith and the biography literature is viewed in a skeptical light by scholars. But the jurists loud on this, and there's a whole spectrum of people, some who are completely critical of all Hadith, others who accept it as complete truth, and then a various number of people in between those extremes. But if we accept the notion that the Hadith, from a historical critical perspective, are unreliable sources for knowing the early history of Muhammad's movement, then we aren't left with much at all. So is it completely hopeless to try to, to reimagine what this period might have looked like, what actually happened? Well, maybe, but probably not. There are other sources, primarily two other sources, which are usually considered to be authentic and contemporary to the life of the Prophet Muhammad. The first of these is actually the Quran itself. There have been fragments of the Quran found that date back to at least shortly after Muhammad's death or even when he lived that show a sort of impressive amount of continuity with the text we have today. The second is a document referred to as the Constitution of Medina. And if it is indeed from the time of the Prophet, then it can tell us some really interesting things about the movement that we later came to call Islam. The constitution of Medina is thought to have been authored at the instruction of the Prophet Muhammad himself shortly after his arrival in the city of Medina, then known as Yathrib. Some background context is necessary here. According to Muslim tradition, the Prophet Muhammad received his first revelation and started his preaching in the year 610, when he was still living in Mecca. As a result of this, he was strongly oppressed and persecuted, along with his growing group of followers, by the ruling Quraysh tribe who ruled the city and saw his message of one god as both heresy and a political threat. The persecution continued for many years and came to its peak in 622 when an attempt was made on Muhammad's life. Shortly before this, Muhammad had received a message from the citizens of a nearby city called Yathrib, who promised to give him and his followers shelter if he was to act as a political mediator between the tribes of the city, and uh, these tribes were sort of bitterly fighting with each other. So Muhammad and his followers emigrated to Yathrib in the year 622, which became known as the Hijra, which means simply the migration, and this is also the start of the Muslim calendar, a sort of year zero. Once he arrived in Medina, he was faced with a situation where he was now the political leader of a number of different tribes, some of which were Jewish tribes and other which follows the, the old uh, pagan Arabian religion. And some were, of course, his own followers, what we would refer to as Muslims today. So this is the context in which the document was authored in an attempt to create a kind of, I wouldn't say state, but a, a political unit, a political uh, order in a city that was sort of ravaged by a conflict between different tribes. The authenticity of this document, as at least partly stemming from this period, is agreed upon by many scholars, both Muslim and non-Muslim. The author Tom Holland, the one who is not Spider-Man, often viewed as part of the very skeptical revisionist school, once stated that the constitution of Medina is accepted by even the most suspicious of scholars as deriving from the time of Muhammad. And while this is a bit of hyperbole in my opinion, it is true that many scholars do accept it as authentic. Frederick M. Denny affirms the same point by saying that there is little doubt among scholars that it is authentic and that it, like the Quran, is intimately connected with Muhammad's thoughts and activity. Some aspects that speak against its authenticity is that it, the earliest examples of it, are from the biographies of Ibn Isha, which was much like the other hadith and biographies written down 150 years after the Prophet Muhammad actually died. And so by that logic it should be viewed in the same skeptical light as the other hadith and sirahs. On the other hand, the, the content of the document itself sometimes speaks for its authenticity. For example, the very negative way that the Quraysh is portrayed suggests a, sort of an early origin for it. Uh, and in my opinion, the very, you could say, liberal or tolerant attitudes that the, the document shows towards unbelievers or non-Muslims like Jews and possibly even polytheists 
um, would be strange for a later period. It would be weird for someone in 750, uh, in a more sort of developed Islamic civilization or empire, to show such leniency towards Jews or unbelievers in general, as this document does. In the book Muhammad at Medina, the scholar W. Montgomery Watt writes that no later falsifier writing under the Umayyads or Abbasids would have included non-Muslims in the Ummah, a point we will get to soon, would have retained the article against the Quraysh and would have given Muhammad so insignificant a place. Moreover, the style is archaic and certain points, such as the use of believers instead of Muslims uh, in most articles, belong to the earlier Medinan period. There are four main groups referred to in the document. The first is the Muhijrun or Mu'imin, meaning immigrants and believers respectively, and which are both words to describe the followers of Muhammad, most of which came from Mecca in the sort of uh, immigration, the Hijra. This is the group that we today would call Muslims, uh, but there are reasons to believe that this is a much later term. Indeed, the document does use the word Muslim, which creates certain problems with that theory. The second are the various Jewish tribes that lived in the city. And thirdly, there are the non-believers, basically polytheists who lived in the city. And lastly, there are the Quraysh, who are mostly used to mean the Meccans and thereby the enemies of this group. The actual content of the document is an attempt to create a social and political unit or covenant under which the people of the city is to live under. Muhammad and to some degree his followers are to be the rulers of this group, this city, uh, but the document or the covenant includes most people living uh, in Yathrib at the time. So let's dive into the document itself for a bit. It, the document begins as follows. This is a prescript of Muhammad, the prophet and messenger of God, to operate between the faithful and the followers of Islam from among the Quraysh and the people of Medina and those who may be under them, may join them and take part in wars in their company. Interesting already is the use of the term followers of Islam, as the term Islam as a designation for a religion was, according to many scholars, not in use until much later. This suggests that this section might have been altered later, or that the use of the term has earlier origins than often claimed. It is also quite interesting that the word Medina is used to refer to the city rather than Yathrib, which was the word that, that was used at the time. And this also suggests that this section or parts of this section may have been edited at a later date. The document then continues to say, they, meaning the people of this covenant, shall constitute a separate political unit, Ummah, as distinguished from all the people of the world. Now this is a significant line. The word Ummah is a very common word in the Muslim world. Um, it is a word that's usually used to refer to the larger, you could say, Muslim community, uh, and thus almost synonymous with Muslims today. But here, it seems that the Ummah has a much larger meaning, and that it may even include people who are non-Muslims living in this city. Other parts of the text also do seem to suggest that anyone who accepts this covenant and what is laid down in this text uh, is part of this social unit or this ummah, and this thus seems to include Jewish tribes as well as those following the old pagan uh, religion. It gives us a look into the early history of a developing religion, and a time when the categories lines between Muslim and Jew perhaps wasn't as clear as it would be later on. After all, Muhammad saw his message as a continuation or correction of the Jewish and Christian religions, and just maybe that distinction wasn't that firmly established yet. Nonetheless, the conception of Ummah as expressed in this document do suggest a larger sort of openness and tolerance than what is perhaps expected. Other parts of the document suggest similar things. For example, and that those who will obey us among the Jews will have help and equality. Neither shall they be oppressed, nor will any help be given against them. And the Jews shall share with the believers the expenses of war as so long as they fight in conjunction. And they, the Jews and the Muslims, shall have each other's help in the event of anyone invading Yathrib. In other words, the Jewish tribes, as long as they accepted Muhammad's rule, was given complete, although probably not entirely complete, equality in Medinan society. They also served in the military together and were equally responsible for protecting the city. Related to this, the later large conquests of the Middle East and North Africa, often referred to as the Islamic conquests, also gets a bit turned on its head once we realize that it seems that Christians and Jews and maybe even Zoroastrians served in that army. Because of this, many have argued that the term Arab conquest is more accurate. 
but we shouldn't of course deny that the, the sort of emergence of Islam as a religion is a huge deciding factor in this historical event. Perhaps most telling for the status of the Jews in Medina is the following. And the Jews of Banu Auf shall be considered as one political community, Ummah, along with the believers, for the Jews their religion and for the Muslims theirs. Again, the idea of the Jews being part of this Ummah is reinforced even stronger. Ummah along with the believers. And the last line tells us something about religious practice as well. For the Jews their religion and for the Muslims theirs. This line gives us a look into the way that religious differences were dealt with in this city. I would argue that this does suggest a kind of religious freedom. The different tribes or different religions were free to practice their religion, again as long as they accepted Muhammad's authority. One interpretation of this then is that the proto-state that was being run in Medina was one in which various tribes belonged to one political unit, an ummah, uh, as expressed in this document, under which there existed many religious, uh, a plurality of religious traditions which all had at least relative freedom. Another interpretation of this is that the Jews constituted an ummah of themselves uh, that existed alongside the Muslims, as the uh, quote seems to suggest as well, uh, but not as part of the same unit per se. It's difficult to know for sure exactly how this was enforced at the time or how it should be interpreted, and thus there are many uh, views of it and it has be de it's been debated for many decades by now. The text never specifically mentions the Arabs living in the city who followed the old pagan tradition, but certain lines seem to suggest that at the very least they lived in the city. And undoubtedly pious believers are the best and in the rightest course, and that no associator non-Muslim subject, shall give any protection to the life and property of a Quraishite, nor shall they come in the way of any believer in this matter. The word associator clearly refers to polytheist. It's a common term used in, in, in Islam. Uh, the cardinal sin of Islam is shirk, which the word itself means uh, association. It's associating God with, with some other God, basically uh, uh, sort of s s synonymous with polytheism. I would suggest that these people were also, if they choose to be so, part of this covenant in, the, in this text. And the valley of Yathrib, Medina, shall be a haram, a sacred place for the people of this code. Thus, based on this, it seems that even the polytheists, or some of them, were protected. Whether or not they were allowed the same religious freedoms as the Jews or other monotheists is of course a very difficult question to answer. All of this points to a situation that may appear surprising to many people, at least in the West. It is undeniable that this covenant or code, especially by the standards of that time, appears to be rather liberal or tolerant. Of course, we should be careful to use such modern terms to describe the past in an anachronistic way, but if interpreted in the way that I and some others have, it pretends a picture of Islam, or what became Islam, that challenges many preconceived notions that people have of it. In the Ummah in the Constitution of Medina, Frederick M. Denny says that the Ummah of the Constitution is made up of believers and Muslims and quite possibly Jews as well, although they may constitute a separate Ummah alongside. The constitution was very much a political military document of agreement designed to make Yathrib and the peoples connected with it safe and that kinship was not the main binding tie of the Ummah, and that religion was of greater importance. Indeed, many of those who like to criticize Islam often point to its violent early history or certain Quranic verses to, to sort of justify this position. Uh, certain Quranic verses, like those in Surah 9, often referred to as the sword verses, and in which the readers are encouraged to kill the unbelievers wherever one sees them. By most Muslims, these verses are understood to be in the context of a battle, and thus only applicable in self-defense. If anything, this document, by the very fact that Jews and other non-Muslims had certain rights and freedom of religion, and the pagans or polytheists lived in the city, shows that any reading of those Quranic verses that is not bound by a specific historical context uh, appear to be very historically inaccurate. It must be remembered that this is just one reading or interpretation of this document. Um, some have argued, for example, as I mentioned, that the, Jew the Jews are not part of the, the same ummah as the Muslims, but a separate ummah. And there's another question regarding why some of the major Jewish tribes that lived in the city at the time isn't even mentioned in the, 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 the document. So what is the nature of their relationship to Muhammad? Are they even part of this document? Do they have the same rights? It's, it's impossible to know. Furthermore, this of course isn't some hippie peace document either. Uh, it constantly reaffirms the superiority of the believers 
slaves to Muslims, and at sometimes it has certain very harsh things to say about the Quraysh tribe in Mecca, who were at war with Muhammad and his followers. The Quraysh should be given no protection, nor shall they who help them. It also lays down certain laws based on Arabian customs and how punishments for murder should be carried out, including payment of blood money and tribe, sort of tribe relations, all of which is in accord with the time and place in which it was written. It makes complete sense and it's a fascinating look into 7th century sort of Arab culture uh, in itself, aside from the fact that it's also a very interesting look into the early Muslim movement. So what is so special about this document? Well, assuming that at least parts of it are authentic, it gives us a fascinating fascinating look into an incredibly interesting and significant historical period and historical event um, and into uh, the movement that would develop into what we call Islam. It shows how the mission and social message of Muhammad was one in which the old social order, primarily based on different tribes and tribal solidarity, was to give way or at least take a back seat to a more unified social order. One in which all was under the rule of God and his messenger and parts of a unified ummah. It also shows us that this ummah, in spite of being ruled under God and the believers, was not one in which religious differences was to be annihilated or assimilated into the new faith, but instead a political system that appears to open for religious freedom and pluralism. The same tendency can be seen in later Muslim uh, empires or caliphates, in which the conquerors were not at all interested in converting the people that they conquered, but just to rule over them. All of society was not to become a Muslim, but to be ruled by Muslims. Based on this, it appears that the Prophet Muhammad was a very clever politician and leader, as he was able to unify a people that were plagued by tribal conflicts to create a nation that was so strong that it was able to conquer a large portion of the worlds after he died. The so-called Constitution of Medina is a significant document today. Many lib so-called liberal or progressive Muslims and Muslim reformers generally tend to use it as a, as a justification for arguing that early Islam was open and tolerant. This is all interpretation, of course, as is most that I have said in this video, but in spite of this, it remains an incredibly interesting document that deserves to be read by anyone who is interested in the subject. Have any of you read this text? And if so, what is your interpretation of it? Do you agree with me and other scholars, or do you have a completely different interpretation of what it means? And uh, do you think that it even is from the time of Muhammad or a later fabrication, for example? I would love to hear your opinions, so please leave a comment and we can continue this discussion. Uh, so, uh, I'll see you next time.